Hello and welcome to a conversation with Dr. Montek Singh Alivalia, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. Montek Singh Alivalia really needs no introduction, a distinguished economist who's been an Indian and international civil servant, a reputation of uh, great intellectual rigor and, and vast experience, hands-on experience in managing the economy. Uh, Montek Singh Alivalia, welcome to this conversation which we're recording on the eve of the uh, meeting of the National Development Council tomorrow. A uh, one-on-one, what is the National Development Council and, and, and what is the significance uh, of this meeting? Uh, you know, the Prime Minister has been quite sort of uh, articulate about laying down the agenda for this, describing it as a, as a workshop, uh, and, and a range of issues from the uh, security of tenure of civil servants, improving quality of uh, teaching, uh, but, but plainly that the, the primary agenda is a, a sort of midterm review of the 10th five-year plan. That's right. Well, you know, the National Development Council, in one sense, is a, the highest uh, body for decision making and deliberation in a federal structure because it includes, is chaired by the Prime Minister, it includes the minister members of the Planning Commission, other members of the Commission, all the chief ministers. And it will be a forum where chief ministers and union cabinet ministers will, in effect, discuss a very wide range of issues. The agenda for this meeting is the midterm appraisal of the 10th plan, which we've just completed. Now that appraisal covers performance in a lot of areas, covers a lot of suggestions on what kind of policy changes are needed in each of these areas. So many of the things you mentioned will be covered anyway. So how substantial a, a, a dialogue is this? Or is this sort of more of a ritual? Has the Prime Minister describing this as a workshop? You know, you're wanting initially, you know, there was a report uh, to suggest that you were considering holding this in Bangalore. Uh, is, is there a move by the government to try and make this more hands-on, more interactive and more engaged instead of just chief ministers coming and reading out their speeches? And no, very definitely. It, it's not a ritual, let me say that, you know, where when chief ministers come and uh, are being listened to and are listening to, Union cabinet ministers, the prime minister, uh, it is an occasion for an exchange of ideas. We're trying very hard to make it as spontaneous as possible, and that's why we suggested that chief ministers can treat their speeches as read, but address some of the issues uh, in a more informal way, and I hope that at least some of them will do that. The Planning Commission is being sort of repositioned in many ways as a, as a think tank. Um, more proactively than it has been in the past. So what is the role of the Planning Commission and your role in this uh, meeting? Well, our role, the Planning Commission, by the way, is always meant to be a think tank because the unique thing about the commission within the government is that it's the one body which is meant to take a critical look, not just at the economy as a whole, but even at central government policies and what state governments should do. Uh, our role in this particular case, of course, is that since the agenda is the midterm appraisal, we've spent the last year reviewing the economy. Now, in this particular case, the midterm occurred just about at the time when there was a change of government. So it's a reconstituted planning commission that is looking at performance in the last three years. We're trying to sort of uh, position policies within a framework which the government has already outlined in the form of the National Common Minimum Program. But you know, we are trying to operationalize that program by looking at what are the things that are really not going well. In effect, uh, building on strengths and correcting weaknesses. So let's look at some of sort of, you know, the, the macro picture. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, the first thing that comes up is the 8% uh, growth that was projected, which doesn't look like anywhere like uh, being achieved. Uh, for four odd percent in, in the first year of the plan, uh, you know, you'd mentioned um, uh, the sort of you know the, the heat of the, the the heat of the economy, uh, which you were relating to the heat outside here in Delhi as we record this. Uh, how serious a problem are the growth figures? Well, it's clear that uh, growth in the first two years of the plan was much lower than would have been needed uh, to reach the eight percent target. Uh, last year, the growth was seven percent, but even so, the average for the first three years is six and a half. Now we hope that in the last two years, that is this year and next year, the economy can accelerate further and the proposals in the midterm review are designed to put in place policies that can bring that about. But I don't think we can do better than an average of seven and a half percent. Now if we do an average of seven and a half, let's say for these two years, then uh, the average for the 
plan as a whole will be a little below uh, 7%. So it's, it's clear that we will not be able to achieve the 8.1% target that was originally set. But you know, the performance of the economy at the present is not bad because uh, at 6.5%, we're still the second fastest growing developing economy if you take major economies. And it's a better performance than uh, many, many other countries. But it's not, I think, good enough and it's not up to what our potential is. And that's what the midterm appraisal tries to focus on. I mean, how do we get to our potential? But within that sort of, the, you know, the, 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 to fulfill that potential, uh, there is, the, you know, there is the aspect of the, sort of, you know, the 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 the, 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 the politics of the of, of the uh, of the economy, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that you are a coalition government, you're under, uh, you know, so many pressures. Uh, has the sort of the that been a a, a problem in being able to carry uh, the, the states with you in terms of, you know, the the, the national policy that comes out of the centre? Well, you know, uh, a coalition government is not the first time we're having a coalition government and given the nature of democratic processes, I think we, we should accept the fact that we will have coalition governments even in future. I don't think that the fact that you have a coalition government prevents you from taking concerted actions. It's true that the management of a consensus becomes a little more difficult. But, you know, in some sense for a very long time, I mean, we've had states that are ruled by different parties. We have coalitions at the center. And, you know, when you don't have a coalition at the center, the different groups that are typically represented in a coalition get represented within the ruling party. So, I mean, planning is about making practical compromises with political realities. And I don't think the political reality has changed all that much. It may be we now have a coalition, but this need to balance different interests has always been there. Uh, I would say, however, that, you know, looking over the last several years, uh, beneath the noise of political discourse, I think there is a substantial consensus, uh, A, that the economy can do well, and B, that politics should make it possible uh, for that good performance to happen. So we're hoping, uh, we have to see, of course, what the chief ministers say, but we're hoping that there will be a broad endorsement of the kind of directional changes uh, that we are recommending, which I think are actually not... Deep down, they're not actually politically controversial. We were talking about the relationship uh, you know, with the states. Uh, obviously, uh, a major problem that uh, the, the plan uh, confronts is the huge, huge deficits uh, that, uh, that the states are incurring and the large amounts of borrowing, which have gone up from, what, 59% to 73%. Uh, with, with that kind and those levels of borrowing, is there any hope that that inflation and, 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 and development, inflation can be contained, development can be accelerated with those very high levels of borrowing? Well, first of all, let me say that the states are not the only ones that are borrowing. The center is also borrowing. So I think we have a fiscal deficit problem both with the center and the states. Now, fortunately, in the last year or two, uh, the center's fiscal deficit position has actually improved, which is a good thing. As far as the states are concerned, they were burdened with very high levels of debt a lot of it incurred at very high interest rates in the past. Now, the Finance Commission report, which the government has accepted, has given the states a certain amount of debt relief. There's been a restructuring of state debt, which makes it much easier for them. And there is an increased transfer of resources to the states. So I think while this is a problem, uh, to my mind, the states have a lot of room to mobilize resources by improving fiscal performance within the state. And that's what we should be concentrating on. And also cutting down losses. I mean, there are very large losses in some parts of the state public sector, which I really don't think a poor country can afford. And uh, in the midterm appraisal, we draw attention to the fact that, you know, whether it's the power sector or the irrigation sector, uh, the states need to bring in reforms that will cut down these losses. Do you think it is the deficit, it, it, it is sort of the, uh, the scarcity of resources that has led to this 2% uh, uh, lower um, uh, outlay, 2% of GDP, lower outlay than had been anticipated, or is it just the inability of uh, states and of the center, uh, of the system to efficiently and effectively use available resources? I think both are clearly important. I mean, I think that uh, scarcity of resources has led, in our view, to significant underinvestment in some of the critical areas of the economy, such as infrastructure. I mean, one of the things that the reforms have done over several years 
is that they have, uh, at least in the industrial sector, they have brought about a very significant capacity of the Indian private industry to improve its competitiveness and to expand production. I don't think they've done as well as they could have, to a large extent because we haven't provided them with good infrastructure. And I think that shortage of infrastructure is due to a resource shortage. But it's also a matter of efficiency and reform within the infrastructure sector. So it's really a combination of both things. To what degree do you think that uh, you know, you've called for a 22% uh, increase in, in, in uh, tax collections 2004-2009, uh, is, is that realistically achievable and to what degree will just that improvement in tax collections you think uh, contribute to this, uh, this shortfall in, in, in resource mobilization for infrastructure in particular? Oh, I think it's definitely uh, realistic that we should have a significant improvement in tax collection without an increase in tax rates. I mean, I would say that uh, looking at our uh, total tax realization as a percent of GDP, uh, with better tax administration and reforms in systems of administration, we should be able to mobilize an extra 2% of GDP uh, over the next two or three years. And 2% of GDP is a lot of money. It's something of the order of 60,000 crores extra. So both at the state level and at the central government level, there is room for doing better without raising tax rates. There is, uh, so let's go back to that, uh, to that concern that I briefly articulated earlier, that uh, e even available resources aren't always efficiently utilized leakages in the system, corruption, inefficiencies. What is the Planning Commission? What are you recommending uh, to, as, as a way out of, 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 of being able to resolve uh, some of these issues? Uh, there's been talk of, you know, bypassing perhaps the, you know, the structure of the state and going directly to the panchayats. What are the mechanisms that would bring this about? Yeah, I mean, first I should say that, you know, there's no magic bullet here. It's not a simple thing. Uh, on the decentralization issue, it is our view that we could hugely increase the degree of accountability and the ability of the system to monitor performance if responsibility both for designing programs, implementing programs, and monitoring programs involve the community in a very active way. Now, many of the top-down programs that have been tried in the past have been found on the basis of evaluations not to achieve their objectives because they're designed somewhere else, implemented by a bureaucracy. The local people that are supposed to benefit from them have very little say. And take a simple thing like, well, education or health or even building of rural roads, improving village facilities, rural drinking water schemes, etc. All the experience we have suggests that if we can get the local community significantly involved in it, then performance improves. And we are very keen to do that. Now, there are constitutional limits to how to do it. But we are trying to find ways of ensuring that at least central government schemes, schemes which the central government funds, uh, are implemented in a way in which the panchayats and communities in general can somehow have a bigger role in participation. You know, the experience varies across states. I mean, there are states where the a panchayati raj system has not actually been well established. And in these cases, decentralization by itself does very little. There are other states where that decentralization process has developed, capacities have been built up, panchayats are effective, and here you get a much, much better end result. So I think we just have to keep on trying, and it's the right way to go. You know, sort of in, 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 in the perception of you know, most of our viewers, uh, we read about economic reforms, you read about the economy doing very well, stock market booming. But I think the questions that, that you know, people will be asking of, of governments and the planning commission is, when is Delhi going to get enough power? When are the farmer suicides going to decline? Uh, in, in terms of everyday experience, when are we really going to experience that things are significantly better? Uh, as, 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 as an economist, you're looking at the macro picture. What do you say to people who are impatient and waiting? Uh, this impatience actually is very good because it puts pressure on governments to perform. I wouldn't, however, say that there are no dimensions in which people feel that things have improved. I mean, for example, there's no doubt that in, say, telecommunications, 
many better things could be done perhaps, but I think most people would agree that the spread of telecom services have not only have gone beyond the common man and are now beginning to be accessible to people who earlier just didn't have that benefit. So here's a sector where the reform process and so on seems to have worked quite well. I would say that in roads, uh, a great deal of emphasis is now being placed both on developing national highways and also in developing rural roads. And from some of the early results that I have seen, uh, the quality of the rural roads that are now being built is much better than what was done earlier. Standards have improved, we're putting more money so that these roads don't get just washed out. I mean, we still haven't covered uh, unconnected habitations, but I think that's a program that's doing well. Power, I agree, is a major problem. Uh, it's a difficult one. Uh, it requires very deep-seated institutional change, and all of it lies in the hands of state governments. I mean, frankly, all that the center can do is to provide a legal framework in which state governments that are willing to reform their power sector and to improve the efficiency of the power sector have the freedom to do so. That is the case at present. You know, the biggest problem in power is the distribution segment. That is where losses are huge, not just because of inefficiency, but also because of corruption. And that is squarely in the hands of the state governments. The center can do nothing. I think many state governments are now aware of it. And some of the early evidence we have suggests that there is an improvement in rationalizing the tariff system, even in improving losses, but it's very small. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised that as of now, in most parts of the country, people do not see an improvement. But there is a systemic change taking place, and we hope that in two or three years uh, going down the same road with better implementation, things will get better. Um, uh, you know, the whole thrust of, of the UPA government was you know, reform with the human face, the agriculture sector uh, that uh, you know, the Prime Minister has been so uh, vigorously talking about, national rural employment schemes, a whole range of issues and, 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 and initiatives. Uh, how successful, uh, what is your assessment uh, of, of the moves in that direction, which in, in a sense have represented the cornerstone uh, of this government's uh, policy and initiatives? Well, I think that quite a significant shift has taken place in priorities to address these very important areas. Uh, first of all, the social sectors, education and health. I mean, these are sectors where, quite frankly, our indicators were much below those of our neighbors in East Asia. Countries that have transited to the 8% growth path that we are talking about have better social indicators, and it's only reasonable that we should be getting there. Now, the government has hugely increased uh, the funding for programs like primary education in the form of the Sarv Shiksha Abhiyan, midday meals, which is a very important instrument for bringing children to school and keeping them there, the ICDS, which provides nutrition for preschool children, uh, and there's a major effort being made at the National uh, Rural Health Mission. So uh, a very substantial response, and the funding at least for the education part, has now been tied up with a cess of 2% on all taxes, which is generating a flow of money uh, which will ensure that these programs really work. Uh, so I think there, there has been a lot. On agriculture, there is a, a new thrust. Uh, we are making major efforts to ensure that areas like irrigation, which are pretty crucial for agricultural productivity, uh, get enhanced allocations and better design of programs. Uh, we're making special efforts again on things like uh, watershed management to ensure water uh, moisture conservation. You know, I mean, 60% of our area is not irrigated. The only way you can increase agricultural productivity is to do something about uh, water conservation. So we're trying to strengthen those programs. I think there are other areas of agricultural reform which will help agriculture to diversify. Uh, reforms in the marketing system. Now, many states have already undertaken uh, legal reforms that will allow modern marketing to start. We're encouraging that. The Minister of Agriculture has announced the National Horticulture Mission, which is going to be a special effort to encourage states that want to diversify into horticulture 
to be able to do so. You know, there is a, a, a weariness in a sense uh, that you know, each time uh, a, a prime minister speaks from the Red Fort, or there's a government and there's uh, a government declaration or a, or a planning commission recommendation of all that is going to be, of going to, going to happen. Um, in a part, you mentioned uh, telecommunications, you mentioned you know, sort of reforms that are happening. Uh, tangibly, experientially, uh, when, what kind of time frame before uh, we begin to experience uh, and, 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 and feel that, that some of these things that you're talking about that are being initiated are, being, are actually beginning to deliver? Uh, beyond uh, in allocation of resources into education, uh, is the education ministry being able to, uh, you know, spend the money? Is it being able? Is it being spent effectively? How concerned are you about those aspects of it? You know, beyond beyond the allocations. No, no, very concerned. Quite frankly, I think allocating money is the simpler part of it. So, in the commission, we are greatly strengthening. Uh, the system of monitoring expenditures. But Give us a few examples that, are that, that reassure the citizens, citizen of India, that look, well, something is going to happen. Health, education, what are you doing? Fair. That's a very fair point. I mean, look, in 1991, uh, literacy in this country was 54%. 2001, it's 64%. That increase is not just in the more advanced states. Many of the educationally backward states are showing increases in literacy of 12 to 13 percent, which is pretty impressive over a decade. Take education. We are now up to 90 plus percent enrollment of children in primary so school. What is the quality of education? Very good. No, no, you're absolutely right. No, there are several stages. Enrollment is stage number one. Preventing dropouts is stage number two. I mean, at the moment, we have close to 100 percent enrollment and 50 percent dropout. And we have to make sure that the kids stay in school and complete primary education. The third question is the quality of the education. It's very difficult to expect any of these things to change instantly. So, I mean, at any given time, the moment you achieve an enrollment target, very rightly you ask the question, what about the quality of education? But I assure you that these are exactly the questions we are asking. I don't think, by the way, that anyone has any doubts, looking at India, that Tremendous progress is being made. So when we look at it from within, I mean, we're falling short of targets. The progress is not universal. There are many groups that are being left out. But, you know, externally, 10 years ago, people were not saying that this country is capable of growing at 8%. Today, they are happily projecting 8% growth. And we are stuck, if you like, at 65 But, you know, 20 years ago, 65 looked like an impossible dream. So, frankly, I think there's a lot of strengths in the economy and there are some important weaknesses. Now, our job at any given time is to focus on the weaknesses. Uh, but I think, uh, looking back, I don't see any reason to believe that we won't make progress in the future as we have in the past. And it may be that uh, when we meet again 10 years later, the telecom story will be repeated elsewhere. Uh, I've no doubt that on the infrastructure sectors, you will see significant improvement, let's say within the scope of the next five years. In many of the sectors we're looking at, it's possible. Both in, in national highways and in rural road connectivity. You have been um, um, uh, in, 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 in various, um, you have worn many hats uh, in, in working uh, with the economy at the, the, the different stages, you know, from, from the World Bank to being uh, a bureaucrat to being the deputy chairman of the Planning Commission. Uh, what, is the, what are the satisfactions that you, you, you personally get uh, with the hat that you now wear? And, 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 and what are the gratifications of the role that you now play? The opportunity to have a, a, a part, maybe a small part, in pushing this economy forward is quite a privilege. One difference between this job and earlier assignments is that in some sense one is covering the whole waterfront. That always raises questions about where is one really making an impact. Uh, the government covers many ministries and we can't possibly concentrate on them all. Personally, I'm spending a lot of my own energies on the infrastructure sectors. I mean, I think that uh, the preconditions for a takeoff uh, have now been well established. The biggest single block 
is infrastructure. And so we're sp I am spending, and I think the Planning Commission is spending, a lot of its own energy in trying to focus on how can it get central government policy to focus on infrastructure issues. Now, of course, there are many other areas where we talk to state governments, encourage them to do things, and so on. But I think there's a big agenda on infrastructure for the central government itself. And this if we can do that, that would be very satisfying. This conversation almost implies that you know, the entire initiative uh, for development uh, and, and, and the changes that will happen in India uh, rest with the government uh, in, in, in an era of, of, of globalization, liberalization. The private sector is playing a very proactive uh, role in this. What is the extent and nature of the interactions that you have uh, with the private sector? For example, is, is there a, a, a seat or a space for the, for the private sector on the National Development Council? Uh, and surely they have a huge role in this process. They have a very large role. And let me say that the midterm appraisal that we have prepared is an appraisal that has been prepared after very extensive consultation with all kinds of stakeholders. I talked about infrastructure as a priority. One of the key strategic decisions we are taking is that the demands for infrastructure are so huge, they cannot possibly be met by public sector resources alone. So the strategy we are trying to outline is how can we get more private sector effectively involved? Now, if you look at the last few years, I mean, it's obviously it's involved in telecommunication. It's been involved in ports. We are trying to get it involved in airports, and that is happening. We're also trying to get it involved in power, where there, where there is private sector activity. But as I said, uh, we are pretty far from having a very satisfactory uh, outcome. So let's not have any doubt about it. The private sector has a huge role. They're not represented in the National Development Council, but that's because the council is a governmental body. However, the deliberations of the council are part of public record. So as a matter of fact, the private sector will have an opportunity to read the midterm appraisal and tell the chief ministers and the cabinet ministers what they think. Uh, we are certainly consulting them very extensively uh, and letting them have an input into our thinking. Now we've said our bit and we'll, uh, we'll wait and hear whether they agree with what we've said or would have a different view. Montek Singh thank you very much. This has been a great thank privilege. You. Thank you.